morning. morning. It was a beautiful, splendid spring day. So, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Also um, I have some announcements. First of all, we want to thank Reverend Richards for being with us again. Um, he's, we always love having him, and so um, we were lucky to get him this month, too. Um, the, Jan Gossett and I are doing a blood pressure clinic. We're usually going to do it the second Sunday. So if you didn't get it beforehand, you can um, get it on your way out of in the Donaldson room. Um, I, I invite you to participate in our coffee fellowship. And um, we, the month of May is open, so feel free to come and, and bring your goodies. The 21st Sunday, the Lilies are meeting the Fellowship Hall for fellowship and our regular um, wonderful time meeting. The month of April, Cridland Food Pantry is 36 cans of peaches, and for May, 36 can, canned pasta. Finally, the day of Pentecost marks the descent of the Holy Spirit unto Jesus' followers, empowering them to spread his message so we can we will celebrate that then. Please join me to the call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Please stand if you are able to sing the hymn of adoration. Thine is the glory, number 238. stand to do the call of confession, and it's in your bulletin. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we gather in this holy place to worship you. This time, we come to you to confess our transgressions and sins. Please listen to our hearts as we pray to you. Join me. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves, 
as we cling to the values of a broken world. Profit and pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and freedom against nation. We abuse your good grips of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and have turned them in bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Friends, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Morning, you all. Everybody's doing well? Everybody's good? Yeah, no. Now I understand we have to wake up a little bit early, right? Well, oh, tomorrow we have school. Well, that's something, isn't it? Well, today we're going to talk about Peter. You all know Peter? He's one of the disciples, right? Yes, it is. Yes. Well, what happened with Peter? But let's, let's remind us something before we talk about Peter. When Jesus left us, he went to uh, his, our father. He told us for the disciples, I give you the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that means? Go to the world and proclaim my word, my heal, my love. So they give us like the power of the Holy Spirit, right? For the disciples. So when Peter was going, um, he was walking, he decided to heal this man that was in the street. So what he did was like, get up and walk. And he did. So wait a minute. Peter did that, right? Why he did that? Because he has the Holy Spirit with him, right? He has Jesus. So he did the name of? Jesus. So when he did that, he felt the power of Jesus. So that means we can do that too? Really? How is that? Word of God. Word of God. So he gave us that, right? So we all can heal friends. We can talk with them. We can pray for them, right? Sometimes you, you pray and sometimes you did it, but, but, but the, you pray to God and that's very good. We pray for him to help others. So we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And Peter emphasized, remembers, that uh, blessed are those that uh, didn't see him, but still believe. So we, that means like, I didn't see Jesus, right? But I believe. How about you all? Yes. I've never seen a mermaid, but I believe it. It's like mermaid. It's exactly like mermaid. We still believe, right? 
So let's pray, pray about the disciples in our life, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you for the disciples. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And give us the chance uh, to, to heal people, to love people, and take care of our friends and family. Thank you for love us, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Good morning. I want to make sure this is, can you hear me now? Okay. Join me for just a moment as we ask God's Holy Spirit to enlighten us. Gracious Father, this is a holy place. This is a holy time. We seek to make our worship holy. We open your holy word and entrust your Holy Spirit that we may see and know a little more perfectly your Holy Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 4. Follow as I read this text. Answer me when I call, O God of my might. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. Our second reading comes from Acts chapter 3, and I will be reading <clears throat> verses 11 to 26. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his, saint, his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, 
and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you from your own people a prophet like me. You must listen to whatever he tells you, and it will be that everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be utterly rooted out of the people. And all the prophets, as many as have spoken, from Samuel to those after him, also predicted these days. You are the descendants of the prophets and of the covenant that God gave to your ancestors, saying to Abraham, and in your descendants all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. The word of the Lord. I find this to be a rather strange text this morning, and somewhat odd. I'll explain as we go along. I want to, first of all, since the reading actually begins in the middle of this story, um, I want to just take a, a minute to lay a little bit of the foundation to help us to make some sense out of these words that come forth from Peter. If you were to look at the beginning of chapter 3, you would see that Peter and John had gone to the temple at the, time, at, at the time for a prayer meeting. Now, there's something interesting. I think this is the only place in all of the New Testament that we knew that there was a prayer meeting. It wasn't Wednesday night. Some of you may remember when we had those way back. Um, and yet, they're on their way, and they are, this is uh, apparently some sort of a Jewish tradition, and they are acting uh, accordingly. And when they get there, they encountered a man who had been brought into the temple who was lame. And so, the lame man asks Peter and John for some, some money, as was the case. Kind of reminds me a little bit of those people with the big signs at the end of the ramp, you know. I, I'm going to give you a little free advice. Do not. I'm not opposed to people who need money, but give it to a nice agency that will distribute it properly. Now that was free, no extra charge for that. So it tells us that Peter confronts this man and he says, we don't have any silver or gold, but we'll give you what we have. And they reach down and take him by the hand and lift him up and he is made whole. Now, that's not strange. We call those miracles. Jesus did all kinds of them during his ministry and this hasn't been this far removed uh, from Jesus' time with them, but this is after Pentecost, so it's probably been at least 50 or more days, and maybe the people had forgotten all about special acts of God that we would call miracles. And it tells us in our text that Peter sees these people coming to him and he says, what's with you guys? You've never seen a miracle before? I mean, why are you staring at us? Now, I, I never realized that Peter was that self-conscious. You know, Peter's the one who's always bragging and telling the Lord what to do. Um, but it's just, these are just odd little things that you find in this narrative. I'm going to ask the choir to forgive me if I don't 
turn around and address you personally. This is, this is for the crowd out here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, your appreciation and listening is great too. I, I love that. Now, he, he's, he's addressing this crowd and he's trying to make it clear to them that they don't have any special powers to be able to make people whole again, but that that power comes from God. Tom Long, in writing um, on this particular passage, said what's also kind of odd about this text is that the people come running onto this portico to see what all the excitement's about, and they get a sermon. Oh, wow. You invite me, and you're going to get a sermon because that's what I do. Okay, but that was prearranged. But this was not. And so here is this crowd. We have no idea how many were involved here. But they come to this event that's happening, and... Peter's got something to say. So that's just a little bit background about the story. And normally I don't take time to fill that in, but I think it's important just so we understand what is this that Peter's talking about, and that kind of hopefully gives it to you. Now here's the sermon. First of all, it's birthed out of the reaction of the crowd. People have often asked me, David, where do you get your inspiration for preaching? And I thank them, first of all, that thinking that it was inspired, that's nice. Um, but I have to tell them, I, now that I'm a really good confirmed Presbyterian, I have to look at the, um, the lectionary and those of you that know what a Presbyterian calendar looks like or have one, you know that every Sunday there are four texts, sometimes more, that are presented, and you look at those. Now, you're not, I'm not obligated to preach from any of those, but nine times out of ten, I do. The inspiration, I would have to confess with Peter, comes from God. I would not do this if I did not believe that God has anointed me to this task and instead of retiring way down in the south somewhere or Arizona, I decided to stick around just to afflict you. And there you go. Now, I got to tell you, this is not the kind of, I, it's nice to be able to talk about somebody else's sermon, which is what I'm going to do, because I don't think I would have the nerve to address a group of people with, you morons, what in the world were you thinking when Jesus was here? Now, that's basically the sum and substance of this sermon. And he says so in so many words. If you, if you still have this passage open, uh, and you can look at uh, uh, beginning, say, at verse 13, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, and here it comes, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. And you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. How are we doing so far? And it goes on. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses and, and so forth. And then he says... In verse 17, and now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. And in this way, God fulfilled what had been foretold through the prophets, etc. 
Peter, under the enabling and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, just basically lets this crowd of people have it with both barrels. Now, I don't, it doesn't really tell us in this particular story how the crowd rejected. We know that if you start off into verse chapter 4, uh, that the, um, the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, and they weren't any more happy with Peter and John doing what they were doing than they were with Jesus. Now, they were able, they think, to get rid of Jesus by crucifying him, but it's not going to go so easily for them here. So you've got two elements of the crowd. You have those who are listening, and you have the others who are listening but not happy about it. Now, preachers sometimes know when the sermon they're preaching is not sitting well with the congregation. Worst case scenario, they just get up and walk out the door. So if you do, I will assume that you didn't like the sermon, and I will say, that's too bad because it's not my sermon. I don't think I would have liked this had I been a part of this crowd. I think what we need to keep in mind, if we gain anything out of this text today, it is that it's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about, together, Jesus. I'll give you a hint, Jesus. Okay. Say it with me, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you. It's about him. I've noticed that up at the little pulpit at Milton, where I'm preaching twice a month, and on the pulpit at Second Church, where I was for many years, is this inscription, Sir, we would see Jesus. That's got to be the sum and substance of what we bring to you today. Now, Peter, perhaps knowing that he doesn't have a whole lot of time to continue this sermon, just says, you scoundrels, you had the best thing that happened to you has been with you for three and a half years or so, and you rejected him. You know, crowd, crowds are a funny thing. They were all enthused when Jesus has that triumphal entry several days before he's to be crucified. We celebrate that as Palm Sunday. And then three or four days later, they're at Pilate's judgment hall, and they're no longer singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Now, and I don't know if this is all exactly all the same people, I'm just saying crowds are fickle. Now they're curious and they're wondering because they know this man, they've, they've seen him day after day after day, and they're wondering, what is this that's happening? Now, the part where the sermon takes, a, I think, a nice turn is when Peter says, I, in verse 17, I know that you acted in ignorance as your leaders did. There's a great old spiritual hymn that says something, Negro hymn, that has something about, please uh, forgive us, Lord. We didn't know it was you. We didn't know it was you. Peter goes on to say to them, look, all of these events had to happen. Jesus had to die. He is, after all, the lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the earth. He had to die. He had to be turned over and judged and put to death 
for crimes that he did not commit. And how thankful we are that although Peter lays the culpability for that act on their shoulders, he says to them it was a part of God's plan. That's stage two in the sermon. Now stage three, if you will. Peter begins to talk to them about how they need to respond. And the first thing he says is in verse, it's 19 or 20, I've noticed the numbering is off by a verse between this one and any other translation, but he says, repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That is so much better than just leaving a crowd of people with this huge sense of guilt. You morons, what were you thinking? You you took the very Son of God and you crucified him and it is he whose name we proclaim. This man who is now walking is healed by the power of the one that you rejected. I saw a t-shirt one time. Should have gone ahead and bought it, but I didn't. It was on eBay, you know, the place where everybody buys everything. And it showed, it was a white t-shirt, and it showed a Dalmatian dog, you know, the ones with the black spots all over the white, standing behind a pulpit and looking down at a congregation of other Dalmatians, and he says, the master says, bad dog, bad dog. I'm so glad that this sermon doesn't end with leaving the people with a sense of guilt and no idea where to go from here. And I'm pretty sure that just as you're paying very close attention this morning, so were they. So were they. What are we to do? And Peter says you need to repent and turn to God. Now, repenting is what we do when we pray that prayer of confession. That is, you speak forth words that you can identify with and you you speak them to God with a plea to Lord have mercy upon us. And the scriptures teach us that he will, certainly, if we ask. So there is an invitation. If you can hear the words that I am speaking, then you need to repent, confess your wrongs, your sins, and turn around because you're going in the right direction. That's what that idea of turn to God. We're going in the wrong direction and we need to turn around and give heed to the words of God so that we might find something that will benefit us from the eternal, holy word of the scriptures that will bring us life and hope and forgiveness. This is probably one of the shortest sermons that was ever preached, even shorter than the mandatory 15 or maybe 20 minutes for a Presbyterian. You'll be glad if you ever have the opportunity, and I would encourage you, if you can sometime, go attend a good Baptist church, because they will go for at least 45 minutes and then have to be sorry that they had to cut it so short. Now, I 
I can say that because I used to be one. And I had that requirement upon me, and I'm so thankful that if I can't say something meaningful in about 15 minutes or more, a little bit more, then you're not going to get it anyway. But I'm so thankful that there are blessings that are promised if we, knowing that we were guilty, knowing that we, we did wrong, that there are remedies for God's people. And it's in the promises here. He says, turn to God there in verse 19, so that your sins may be wiped out. Hear the good news, we said. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And our response is, thanks be to God. Now, sin and guilt, we don't maybe think of it as sin all the time, but guilt is something that many, many, many people are trying to shoulder all on their own. And that includes many who call themselves Christians. They're not worthy. No, you're not worthy. That's why Jesus had to die for you, and that's why you have to acknowledge that and turn to God. Your sins can be forgiven. You don't have to carry that guilt with you over and over. And he, then he mentions about, in that next verse, times of refreshing. Times of refreshing. Like finding the shade of a tree when you've gotten all warmed up in your garden or mowing your grass or you take a break and go in the house and drink a draft of cold water. That's what that's all about, times of refreshing. You know, when we're, when we're guilt-laden and we feel unworthy, wouldn't it be nice to have someone like our Heavenly Father tell us, just turn to me and you will be refreshed? And then he goes on in the next verse to talk about the restoration of all things. I'm going to be glad when a time is going to come in the future, in God's time scale, when I'm going to first of all be glad when we don't have to divide ourselves among Republicans and Democrats. Won't that be something? And you're not going to have to listen to people promising the same old rhetoric that they've been promising for the last 20 years or more. I don't generally get political, but I'm just going to step out here just briefly. I marveled a few days ago when I saw this new guy is running for something here in our area, and he's talking about, if you'll vote me in, I'm going to get rid of the West Virginia income tax. Have we not already got that in the works? Yeah, we do. So vote for him. And um, I don't even know what party he's affiliated with. But wouldn't it be nice to know that there is coming a time when God is going to establish a world order through Jesus Christ in which he alone is going to be in charge and it's going to be perfect. Amen? Amen. Thank you very much. So, a restoration is coming. Forgiveness of sins is available. Um, refreshing and restoration and all of that, just simply if we will hear God's words today and we will receive them and we may be, we may be pricked in our hearts or in our consciences. And that's a good thing. To know that our ways are wayward. They may be well-intentioned. They may seem like a good thing. But it is not in a man to direct his steps, say the scriptures. It's in God. 
And he's offering you everything that you could possibly want. Why would you reject it? Amen. I'm inviting you to turn to our next hymn, Come Ye Faithful, Raise the Strain, 234, Standing as You Are Able. invite you at this time to continue in worship by the giving of your tithes and offerings. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
gracious God, will you now take these gifts, bless those who have given, who could not, Father, but that your ministry and our works here may continue in the days to come. And for this we give you thanks. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. There, I'm assuming that your insert, which I've lost mine, but uh, has a list of people that you are praying for. And so I invite you to join me as we pray together, and then I will bring you in and we will speak the words of the Lord's Prayer together. <clears throat> Our gracious God, we are fully aware that it was us, it was your people, it was humanity that decided back in the Garden of Eden that we did not need to listen to your words or obey. And we chose our own path. We are aware, our Father, that our Lord had to come to be that perfect sacrifice, to shed his blood, to die so that we might live again. We are aware, Father, that there are troubles in the world, there are acts of nature, governments, wars that fight and kill each other in the name of their own agenda. In this congregation, Father, there are those who are laid aside on beds of illness. There are those who are still bearing their own load of guilt and shame. And our Father, oh, that they might hear your words and turn and be saved. We ask our Father that you will continue to place your good hand upon this congregation. May your Holy Spirit have free reign in the elders. And will you continue, our Father, to provide as these people faithfully serve and give and come. And our Father, having heard these words from Peter's lips and your heart. We pray those words that our Lord taught us to pray when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join me, please, in standing as you are able and let us speak together these words of our affirmation of faith today. Together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue as we close our worship with 494. Friends, we have heard the good news today. I charge that you hear it with your heart and believe it. Renew your relationship with Almighty God and enjoy the promised blessings that he has promised for us as we believe. And now, as our worship has ended and our service begins, go forth renewed, restored, refreshed, and blessed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.